You're listening to The Fan Marillion, an unofficial companion podcast for the Amazon Prime series, The Rings of Power. I'm your host, Glorfindal, reacting to the show each week and wishing Hugo Weaving were 20 years younger, I tell you. The premiere draws near. I can feel it. But I can also read a calendar. On this pre-show, we're going to rev up for the September 2nd premiere. We're going to talk about the casting. My predictions about the story, based on what we've seen from the promotional material so far, talk about some concerns circling around the show prep, some I share, some I don't, and uh, we're going to all together get pumped for Hot Elf Autumn, or Hot Elf Spring for the Southern Hemisphere listeners. So my thing with Tolkien is that there are so many gatekeepers, so many self-proclaimed lore masters in the fandom, it can get excruciating just trying to coexist without being scoffed at, much less talk about our interests and really connect. So my thing on this show is going to be to talk about the Rings of Power series and bring in the lore we know and love to add context and color to every episode, but in a totally accessible way. The stories, the people, the worlds are all interesting and formative, and so much of modern fantasy comes directly from the Tolkien universe. He's a premier force behind most modern fantasy, so it's important to keep this in mind as every new generation discovers and falls in love with fantasy, just like I did. There's always room in the tent, and I can't wait to have someone new to talk with about the Tolkien universe. So let's get right into it. Here's what we know about the story. It'll cover five distinct activities of the Second Age of our beloved Middle Earth, as described in the Return of the King appendices and a few other sources. And we know this from the promotional materials that have come out to date. So let's go through each of these one by one. So the first thing the story is going to cover is elves, the elves crafting the titular rings of power and Sauron crafting the one. We haven't seen Sauron yet, but I'm glad because some things shouldn't go in trailers. We also haven't seen Celebrimbor do any forging. It might not be forging time yet, and that's cool. We've got many seasons to forge these rings and hear some lyrical poetry about the one. For example, I hear it rules them all and finds them and occasionally in the darkness binds them. For our first age and Silmarillion fans, we've seen elves flashing back to the first continent with the trees of Valinor. Maybe some kinslaying. We saw what I suspect was uh, some crossing of the Hel Karaxi ice sheets, and I only know how to pronounce that from the audiobook, so don't give me any credit. The Hel Karaxi ice sheets are uh, like the North Pole of their planet, which is Arda, and they do this in order to leave the elf home, also called Ama, and come over to the continent of Middle Earth. So we're going to see two different continents on this show, probably through flashbacks. So Middle-earth is where our story takes place. We also saw Galadriel's wartime flashbacks while speaking with Elrond, which makes me think what we saw there in fiery orange and ash in the trailer was what's called the War of Wrath. Now, the War of Wrath ended the First Age. The War of Wrath would have been when one of the elves successfully convinced the Valar to come assist the elves in Middle-earth, and they finally showed up after eons of suffering, to maybe help. So that's excruciatingly Catholic. That tracks Tolkien. So when the Valar finally show up to help their uh, elf friends, they smash up Morgoth's strongholds of Angband and Thangorodrim, that's fun to say, and captured Morgoth, yelled at Sauron a little bit, dispersed the minions, Uh, The Balrogs that survived dispersed and went down into the earth. The coastland was totally banged up and flooded, which is why you don't see land called Beleriand on Third Age Middle-earth maps, by the way. It's under the sea. So that was inarguably the most stressful event in Middle-earth. So if Galadriel is talking to Elrond about the most devastating thing and about which he's too young to have seen, we're talking about the War of Wrath. So we're really excited about the potential for those flashbacks. 
So that's the elves. The second activity we're going to see on the show is about the island of Numenor. And I bring this up because we see Galadriel there meeting Halbrand and also meeting the Queen of Numenor. Uh, that leads us to believe that Numenor's devastating fate is going to be part of the show. Now, I don't want to get spoilery for casual fans, but you'll probably learn that the culture on Numenor is heading into dark territory right away in the show. And uh, you can make some deductions about where that leads on your own. As part of the Numenor quest line, you're going to meet Isildur. And you know that name from trilogy flashbacks. Yes, the Isildur that cuts the ring. He is of the line of Numenorean kings, the Edain, as they're called, who traditionally helped the elves during their first age and were therefore blessed with a nice cozy island to live on away from the mess made of the primary continent as a result of the War of Wrath. So who else is in Numenor that we've seen so far? We've got the Queen of Numenor and her right hand Alfarazon. Book readers will recall Alfarazan becomes a big player, so we can assume he'll fulfill his storyline for the most part as written, even if he's not the king anymore, but another person of power and influence in the kingdom. The enhanced character of the Numenorean queen seems like she'll be a, a righteous figure meant to contrast with Alfarazan and uh, maybe help showcase the city's conflict for viewers throughout the show. For example, um, these chapters in the Silmarillion were pretty light on detail regarding the faithful. So I suspect the altered queen character will flesh that out for us. And uh, we see her sharing some warnings with Galadriel and vice versa over a Pelantir. And you'll remember that shiny crystal ball from the Rings trilogy as well. The last big player we've seen in the human location is a newcomer named Halbrand. Not to be confused with the Return of the King book character Halbarad who is also a Numenorean descendant. A little Easter egg there for us. So we know without any room for misunderstanding, these people are very much associated with the Dúnedain we know and love from Return of the King. In fact, that's not really an Easter egg. That's more like beating us over the head. It's Halbarad with one letter changed. All right. I'm not going to get heated over it. But the new character of Halbrand, I assume, was created from Jeff Bezos' request for more Aragorn. And the writers sighing and answering, all right. I had to double take, but being someone who, yes, guilty, had the swoony Aragorn and sword poster over my bed as a teenager, the fact even I thought it was de-aged Strider at first says a lot. Charlie Vickers may not be Viggo Mortensen, but there was a time when Viggo Mortensen was not Viggo Mortensen either, if you catch my meaning. So Charlie Vickers may yet fill the shoes that have clearly been set out for him. We'll be watching, Charlie. Seize your moment. Get hung over the next generation of teenagers' beds. And uh, please don't send that to my lawyer. We also see the dwarven city of Khazad-dûm. This is going to be probably the third area of Middle-earth that we cover on the show. Khazad-dûm is in the heart of the Misty Mountains, which you'll recognize as becoming Moria during the uh, Jackson trilogies. So remember when I said the Balrogs that survived the War of Wrath went underground? Well, guess where one of those cozy hibernation spots was? You saw it in the Rings trilogy, none other than the Mines of Moria. We see one of the lines of Durin and his wife are going to take us through that story, wherein, presumably, we learn just how they delved too greedily and too deep. This Balrog, for that reason, was called Durin's Bane because it brought down the kingdom of Durin. Now, in these press stills, we see this particular Durin. Don't know which Roman numeral and don't care. There's no timeline, so none of it matters. And we'll talk about chronology later. But uh, we see this Durin collaborating with Gil-galad, who is king of the High Elves at this time. We call them the Noldor. This is a very specific kind of elf that came from Eldamar, or Elfin Home. They're like upper-class elves. They're top-shelf elves, and they are old as fuck. So the dwarves and the high elves are going to be in cahoots in some fashion, which tracks with what we learned in the uh, Unfinished Tales. So there's lore that supports Celebrimbor and the dwarves working together. 
but <sighs> the relationship between the high elves and the dwarves stretches across multiple elf kingdoms and multiple dwarf kingdoms so it seems like they're trying to drill multiple peoples down into one and i understand why they're doing this for the sake of a screenplay but I don't know how it's going to play out for fans or if it's going to just make things too simplistic and watered down to really have oomph. It's a risk. Let's see how it plays out. Which brings me to Sauron. The last activity this show is going to cover is arguably the biggest. It's Sauron. And uh, all of his orcs we see running amok throughout the trailer, we can assume they report to him. Sauron will be circling around all of those other groups I just mentioned, and who will ultimately get rings. Spoiler. Absolutely charming their socks off, he will, because Sauron during this era is, um, well, there's no sugarcoating it. He's hot, and he's hot on purpose. He's charming. This is his uh, charming form that he adopts before the dark blob that you know and love from the rings trilogies. So very briefly, in those films, though, we saw flashbacks to this time period at the beginning of The Fellowship, while Kate Blanchett's Galadriel gave us that, that charming exposition. We saw Hugo Weaving's Elrond lead a battle on the slopes of Mount Doom, and then we see Isildur cut the ring. So that's the era we're talking about when we see Sauron having a body. So what is this Maiar? We hear people say... Sauron is a Maiar. People have a lot of questions about that. Maiar can take spiritual forms, but they can also take corporal forms. So let's uh, take it all back and talk about the races of Middle Earth here. So the Maiar are not tier one gods. Tier one is called Iru Iluvatar, and he made Middle Earth and all of its continents. They're not even tier two. Tier two gods are called the Valar, who came first and built everything we see on Middle Earth, uh, pretty much, other other than what the elves built. <laughs> the Maiar are tier three. They're more like angels than gods, very powerful when they want to be. And many fans may not realize this, but Sauron is a Maiar alongside some other individuals you're familiar with, Gandalf and the other wizards, and even Balrogs. You met one in the Mines of Moria, and Radagast. Radagast Brown is the same species as a Balrog and the same species as Sauron. Make it make sense. So why is Sauron so ripped with eight-pack magical energy and then Radagast is so radagasty? Well, just like some humans are eating rocks and some are splitting atoms at the Large Hadron Collider, Middle-Earth creatures are not all created equal. Remember that the wizards were ranked with Saruman being the wisest and head of the order. Maiar have their own skills and their own levels of strength. And at a certain point, the nature versus nurture dynamic segues over to nurture. So remember that Saruman hurt his power levels by wishy-washing himself over to evil to feed his greed. And Gandalf increased his power by pushing himself into epic victories. So given that Sauron was top disciple of Melkor, which is a, a big bad of the old world, Sauron majored in evil plotting at Valar Disciple University under Melkor for literally three ages of the earth. So that's way more postdoc magical work than uh, Radagast. We can assume that Radagast uh, spent his study time in the dorms, smoking up and feeding the birds. Now, let's talk about the chronology. I suggested it earlier that time has no meaning, so I want to talk about that. Now, from all that I've described here, you might find it surprising and perhaps difficult to believe that all this juicy content takes place all around Middle Earth at exactly the same time to cover what we're guessing is going to be six seasons of fast-paced human years television. And this all culminates in the last alliance of elves and men and the defeat of Sauron in the battle that ends the Second Age. How interesting that it all takes place in six years. You would be right to be suspicious. What I've described is basically everything that happens in the whole of the Second Age that's noteworthy. And the dwarf events of Khazad-dûm 
actually creep into the third age in a little bit. So, wow, that's potentially alarming and makes me think events that naturally require lots of buildup uh, and may make sense to unfold the way they do given longer periods of time and have lots of other contacts, they might feel rushed and unconvincing and inauthentic, all scrunched together like a plot checklist. Dare I mention the last two seasons of Game of Thrones? I think people are nervous. And Sauron is involved in all of these events at the same time, happening all across the world. So just like in Game of Thrones, when it felt like characters were taking a plane all around the continent between scenes, I'm a little worried it might feel like that if Sauron's going to be involved in all of these different events. So that's red flag number one, and I think it has serious merit. You know, there's a lot of petty complaints on the internet, which I will cover uh, later on tonight, but this, this is number one, I think. This is what people should be focusing on, and I don't see anyone really talking about it. The storyline condensing will also have to wipe out a lot of the accomplishments the characters are known for. I'm thinking specifically of Elendil and Isildur and uh, Anarion, I think is Isildur's brother, if I remember right. They all sail from Numenor over to what is present-day Arnor and Gondor, and they establish all those cities from the Third Age. And they build the Argonoth, that's the statues of the two kings by the waterfall that we see at the beginning of Fellowship with the hands. So I think that's going to have to all already be there when the series starts. And same with Elrond founding Imladris, which is Rivendell. That's all going to have to already be there. These are events that unfold slowly throughout the Second Age with lots of context and reasons. And uh, I, I don't think we can watch all that happen. I think it has to already be there when the show starts, which is fine. I mean, these are casual losses, but my suspicion is that a lot of the gravity of events is going to be diminished by just pushing it all into six years. I, I think this is this is going to be a potential loss to the show here. So we'll see what we see. I'm not going to linger on that too much, but um, I'm pretty worried about it. So let's talk costumes. The trailer's out. We see the press stills. We see people with beautiful hair, beautiful faces. But I need to talk about the clothes. The forums are near unanimous on the costumes being underwhelming. And while there's not a costuming department on this earth who could ever live up to the pressures of what costuming on a billion dollar series should look like in everyone's minds, I feel like this ain't it. And they had six movies of blueprints to follow. That's the knife in the kidney here. I mean, the orcs look great. Not high praise when other costuming should have captured my attention, but I did notice the orcs look great. Where to start? The elves are wearing plain Victorian nightgowns in one scene. I mean, it looks like they're on a ship and they're wearing nightgowns. This better be a flashback to, and then Iru created the elves, because that's the only context here while I'll accept those nightgowns. Hallbrand's armor looks like Weedo Workshop called in sick for six months straight and then had to turn something in real fast at the end. I had a thought that maybe they're trying to show how far superior craftsmen the elves are at this stage in Middle-earth. So if that's what that is, what a troll. You got me. Gilgalad looks great. Gilgalad, excuse me, lore masters, please send me an email. Uh, but I went back and looked at canon royal outfits, and both Thranduil and the Hobbit-era Elrond wore single-tone drapey pieces. And uh, they look stunning in their scenes, so I'm thinking I need to reassess the costumes seen in the actual worlds and not, you know, promotional stills where I can just focus on it. I think I'm being unfair. But as an aside, I, I also don't think film studio costume designers were ever meant to coexist in a timeline that includes 4K television. I just don't think that's fair. Listen, I saw an unexpected journey on opening night, 3D, in that much maligned high frame rate setting, and I assure you, the prosthetics, makeup, and costumes from the Hobbit trilogy all look far more flattering to their art departments in the lower frame rate. So we're also judging costuming for a fantasy series through extremely detailed screens in ugh, pretty unprecedented ways. 
I guess what I'm saying is I need a few episodes before I land on any firm position about costuming. So let's talk about music. Howard Shore is back. He was the composer for the two Jackson trilogies, uh, but he's brought some help. And what help he brought? Fantasy and sci-fi music titan Bear McCreary is here. This man looks like he belongs in a prog metal band, and he sounds like Hans Zimmer and Danny Elfman had a baby. He scores all kinds of projects, but where he seems to collect his cult followings is his sci-fi and fantasy television series and video games. So I'm talking Battlestar Galactica, Outlander, The Walking Dead, God of War, Snowpiercer, Black Sails. So basically anything Stars puts out, I guess. And he scored the most metal sci-fi on TV right now, which is Isaac Asimov's Foundation series on Apple TV, which I about lost my mind over this year. Uh, Before there was Rings of Power on Amazon, people, there was Foundation on Apple TV. Seriously, watch it. And quick plug for Foundation, it stars another Tolkien alum, the glorious Thranduil actor, Mr. Lee Pace. He plays three different people, maybe more. I lost count after a couple episodes. So while we're talking about the second age, might as well talk about all the Tolkien inspired metal I spent my whole youth listening to. Blind Guardian and Battle Lore, both bands still active, by the way, they're still trucking and putting out incredible material to this day. Well, Battle Lore actually just got back together and are touring. It's just a shame Americans don't like Tolkien metal like Europeans like Tolkien metal. Amon Amarth is literally the elvish word for Mount Doom, folk metal people. But I mentioned Tolkien metal because, and I'm still on this bit, if anyone can pull off some cartoon metal moments, it's our man, Bear McCreary. That's right. He did Metalocalypse. Bear, I'm counting on you. Don't fail me. Let's talk casting. The dwarves and humans all look great. No complaints. The Harfoots, which are the early hobbits, apparently they walk amongst the Ents. Who knew? Uh, Honestly, I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit. No one who's reading the Second Age lore cares about hobbits. We're here for elves. We're here for the fall of Numenor. So here's to hoping the Harfoots don't overstay their welcome and occupy too much of each episode. Um, Personally, they took up like 20% of the trailer, and that's 20% too much. But sure, casting, they look fine. Fine. They're hobbits. Don't care. Where Amazon goes haywire is with the elves. I need to talk about the elves. And with such an easy template to build from with Peter Jackson's work, it's just, it's mystifying fans. The elf casting is high stakes, and it can't have been easy. But in terms of design and template, you know, nothing needed to be invented here. Peter did all the heavy lifting nearly 25 years ago. So then it was odd when the elf photos started trickling out and Elrond looks like a goblin. There's no sugarcoating that. He's a goblin. Galadriel, she's fine. She's plain, but I love that about her. She's like traditionally gorgeous, you know, no eyeliner, no nothing. She's just classic beauty. She's great. Um, But I need to talk about Uncle Celebrimbor, who keeps overcooking the steaks. He is dressed in like a velvet, crushed velvet dress that you'd find at a vintage thrift shop, and I'm not thrilled about it. Everyone else is fine. Gil Galad is fine. He looks a little bit too much like Martin Sokar, who did Celeborn from the original trilogy. He was, uh, Gil Galad is going to be the king of the elves. Um, so I wish he looked a little different, but that's fine. I'll buy it. Honestly, in terms of jawline and brow and eyes, you know, the new character is winning the elf look. Uh, his name is Ismail, Ishmael Cordova. Ishmael Cordova. I'm not sure if I'm saying his name right, but he's the newcomer playing the new character, Arondir. And honestly, as far as the elves go, he looks the most elvish of all of them. And I'm going to get some heat for that because he's also the only elf of color that I've seen so far in the promotional materials. And yet at the same time, he looks the most elvish. I'm talking jawline. I'm talking brow. Those sparkling eyes. I mean, what? He's the best casting so far, and he's the one that's getting the heat. I just don't get it. Now, if you don't know much about this guy, um, 
you wouldn't be alone. I don't, I haven't seen him in too much stuff, but the, I haven't seen too much about the other actors either. So we're just going to have to see how that plays out. I kind of like the idea of no names. That's kind of rude. They have names. Uh, newcomers on the scene of acting. I, I, I like a fresh take with young actors. So let's see how this goes. Uh, guys, I hate to tell you this. The universe has walking trees, wizards, and magic rings. So um, I think melanin is not far-fetched. I just, I'm putting it out there. I'm, I'm here for Aram Deer. But the complaints about what I'll call um, token casting, I've seen it called far worse, but I'll stick to quote-unquote token casting, it feels a bit reminiscent of the complaints that went into Peter Jackson's trilogy and the uh, changes that he made. Uh, even if they were simply lines or activities being moved around, I'm thinking specifically about Arwen being present earlier in the story and actually doing a few things, like two things. She did two things. And Eowyn, you know, did one or two extra things as well. Gasp. A whole two women existed in Middle Earth plots and had lines. It was too much for the fandom circa 2001. And now 20 years out, the Jackson trilogy is damn near considered the gold standard for adapting fantasy epics. And the fans complain so much about these women getting extra lines. So I'm not putting too much stock in the longevity of these casting complaints. I think they'll fade away uh, in a couple years. And I think the casting complaints obfuscate what I think is the only and also the insurmountable roadblock to this being brilliant. I'm worried about the rights. I keep reading that they don't have rights to a lot of the material that they're trying to cover. And I don't understand that too much. Because while the literature says that, I just don't see that reflected in the trailer. So, for example, the Rings of Power trailer we saw with the Numenorean Queen using the Palantir. Um, I understand they can follow those breadcrumbs back to a few references in The Lord of the Rings, but... Um, it can be confusing to figure out what exactly they have rights to. Some things from the Silmarillion book, like direct lines for Elrond, or the Dol Guldur events with Gandalf and Saruman. I mean, we saw these exact things that are from the Silmarillion in the Hobbit trilogy. So as worried as I might have been before all this footage came out, the more I see, the more relaxed I am, but they're finding a way to extract exactly the, the content that they need to build this story. So in the Rings of Power trailer, we saw the trees of Valinor. We saw what could only be the War of Wrath. These items are nowhere to be found, to my memory anyway, in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. So they got these items somehow. I, I have complete faith that they're going to get enough of the events to at least give us a taste. I mean, Tolkien wasn't a very detailed writer. He was detailed about events and sequences and names. But I mean, he could describe a hundred years worth of content in a paragraph. That's not a lot for screenplay writers to go on. There's going to be a certain amount of fan fiction necessary to pull this off. It's such a flex, you know, only a crazed billionaire would do something so expensive and simultaneously ill-advised. Only Amazon could afford to do this, which is why I'm convinced that no matter how season one turns out, they're going to do this for six years. I mean, Jeff wants it. And Jeff apparently got a second Aragorn, so Jeff gets what he wants. <sighs> Speaking of fan fiction, and the Tolkien universe in particular, I spent half my childhood frolicking outside like an elf, and the other half writing fan fiction on my 1997 model power Macintosh. <sighs> I'd make cinnamon butter toast or oatmeal and drink orange soda and write from 10 p.m. until dawn. I was like a fan fiction vampire. And the only thing that pulled me out of bed in the daylight was to check my reader reviews in real time. You know where I don't want fan fiction, though? My billion dollar Lord of the Rings prequel. So the first look for the series was a Vanity Fair or it was Entertainment Weekly. Um, it listed all the top characters and it was like one right after the other original character created for the series, original character created for the series. And after a whole page of these, you sensed an entire fandom cringing. Like you have a legendarium so robust that we have scholars who literally specialize in it. 
but most of the show is original characters. This is why I'll be ranking each episode by how many glasses of wine I have to pour before the credits roll. So episode one, I'm hoping is no more than three glasses of wine out of five. But if I get to five, I assure you, you'll hear about it the next day, though, because I'll be dead. I want to talk about the Battlestar Galadriel drivel online. Oh, no, she's wearing armor and rides a horse. It's not in the books. Yes, it is. Does Tolkien have to spell it out for you or can you read context clues? Here's the thing. Galadriel is the oldest elf in Middle-earth. She was born in Amun in the First Age, and she's related to Fëanor, the first evildoer amongst the elves. I mean, she survived multiple kin slayings, uncountable orc attacks. She survived the dangerous march across continents and the ice sheets of the Hill Caraxi. She survived the War of Wrath, for crying out loud. She's a leader. Tolkien gave her a ring of power and an entire realm to rule. Is it really out of the realm of possibility to you that she's even mildly capable of the shit her people do the same shit her people do on the regular. Here's what tickles me, though. Q, 20 years ago, in the Peter Jackson Fellowship movie, we see Elrond for the very first time, also a lord of an elvish realm, fully armed and leading a regiment up the slopes of Mount Doom at the Last Alliance. Elrond is younger than Galadriel. He is half-human. But no one batted an eyelash. Of course he'd be armor clad. He can do both. He can wear his soft crushed velvets at his council, surrounded by fountains and harps and golden leaves in Rivendell, and also sometimes slaughter some orcs on the slopes of Mount Doom. Galadriel, when engaging in the same activities, it becomes ludicrous. Why? What? Tolkien never said Galadriel was a hulking badass, and he never said she wasn't. He gave us context clues. The same he gave Elrond, but fan culture accepted it about Elrond with no questions asked. This is why the backlash about Galadriel upsets me. The ridiculous double standard. Why do the female characters have to fight so hard just to exist when they are literally canon? the toxicity is rampant. Like, I'm not opposed to pushing back against original characters like Bronwyn, who's also in the trailer. But I mean, you come at me about Galadriel, who is literally a canon badass and OG Noldor and the oldest elf still left in Middle Earth, wielding one of the three rings of power. And I'm going to call you a bigot. Yeah, because there's no way around that treatment because you don't have a leg to stand on with these arguments. And if you start off with Battlestar Galadriel, unironically, I'm going to assume everything else you have to say is nonsense. Send me an email, thefanmarillion at gmail.com so I can ignore it and then press delete three days later. By the way, I don't see how bigots continue to delude themselves that Tolkien's work is conservative when it has progressive moments all the time. Like Isildur is literally a tree hugger. He saves the white tree of Gondor not once, but twice from extinction by transporting its fruit or a seedling. He's an endangered botanical conservationist. Write that down. So I'm ready for September 2nd, if you all are. I'm eager for any Tolkien content whatsoever. And to prove my point, I'll confess to being an absolute lover of the Hobbit trilogy, Extended Edition. So it takes a lot to put me off of Tolkien content. Uh, so if someone like me is a little worried about the series, that should give pause. But um, I'm willing to go into it. Obviously, I'm going to watch it all multiple times. Here we go, fandom. You know, we'll have each other. We're going to be OK at the end of this. And we'll have some wine along the way. I'm going to take us through each week and break down the episode. I'm going to react and dissect everything we watched. Whatever you loved, whatever you hated, you're going to hear about it on this show. And with that, I bring you this week's Tolkien trivia. On maps, what odd geometric shape is the island of Numenor? Odd in that you don't see islands take this shape. Clearly, Numenor was always meant to do something special, because the island is the shape of a star. And because we're excited for the dwarvish plotline in Durin's kingdom, the vocab word of the week is Chazad. 
It's dwarvish for themselves. Dwarves. So you might recognize this word from a location in fellowship, the Bridge of Khazad-dum. Well, the kingdom itself was called Khazad-dum in its heyday, not just the bridge. So after the Balrog devastated it, the elves renamed it Moria, which in their language means Black Pit. Yeah. Yeah, the same elves who just lost their kingdom to Sauron a few lifetimes prior. Y'all need to clean your house before you come over and call the neighboring dwarf hall a black pit. Assholes. I'm Glorfindal, and this was my show. I welcome your opinion, but remember, I'm not the fandom, just a fan. Join the conversation at Fan Marillion on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Or for flaming too spicy for socials, send me an email at fanmarillion at gmail.com. This has been an Opus Knox Media production. Produced and edited by Ali Bachman. For more information on Opus Knox Media, please visit opusnoxmedia.com.